May Zeus, who guards suppliants, look graciously upon our company, which boarded a ship and put to sea from the outlets of the fine sand of the Nile. For we have fled Zeus's land, whose pastures border Syria and are fugitives, not because of some public decree pronounced against blood crime, but because of our own act to escape the suit of man, since we abhor as impious all marriage with the sons of Aegyptus. It was Danaeus, our father, advisor, and leader, who, considering well our course, decided as the best of all possible evils that we flee with all speed over the waves of the sea and find a haven on Argos's shore. For from there descends our people, sprung from the caress and breath of Zeus on that gnat-tormented heifer. To what kinder land than this could we come with these wool reeds branches in our hands, sole weapons of the suppliant? O oh, realm, O oh, land and clear water, gods on high and earth-bound powers, grievous in your vengeance, which inhabit the tomb. And you, Zeus the savior, invoked third, the guardian of the inhabitants of the righteous men, receive as suppliants this band of women with the compassionate spirit of the land. But the thronging swarm of violent men born of Aegyptus, should they set foot upon this marshy land, drive them seaward, and with them their swift ship, and there may they encounter a cruel sea with thunder, lightning, and rain-charged winds, and perish by the tempest's buffeting blasts if they ever lay their hands on us, their cousins, and mount unwilling beds from which right holds them aloof. And now I invoke as our champion from beyond the sea, the calf born of Zeus, the offspring of the flower grazing cow, our ancestress, the caress of Zeus's breath. The appointed period confirmed itself in a name suited to the event, Epiphus, to whom she gave birth. And now in the region wherein our mother first pastured, by recounting the story of her distress of long ago, I shall now set forth reliable proofs to the inhabitants of the land and other evidence, though unexpected, will yet appear. Men will come to know the truth as my tale proceeds. Now, if by chance there be some neighbor in the land who knows the song of birds, when our complaint greets his ear, he will fancy that he hears the voice of Metis, Tyrius's piteous wife, the hawk chased nightingale, for she, constrained to leave her green leaves, laments pitifully her accustomed haunts and composes the tale of her own child's doom, how he perished, destroyed by her own hand, victim of the wrath of an unnatural mother. Even so, I, indulging my grief in Ionian strains, pain my tender face sun darkened and black by Nile's sun, and my heart unexercised in tears. And I gather the flowers of grief, anxious whether there is any friendly kinsman here to champion our band, which has fled from the haze shrouded land. But gods of our people hear and regard with favor the cause of the righteousness. If you refuse youth fulfillment of its arrogant desires and readily abhor violence, you would be righteous towards marriage. Even for those who flee hard pressed from war, there is an altar, a shelter against harm through respect for the powers of heaven. But may Zeus grant that it go well with us, for Zeus's desire is hard to trace. It shines everywhere, even in gloom, together with fortune obscure to mortal men. From their high towering hopes, he hurls mankind to utter destruction, yet he does not marshal any armed violence. All that is wrought by the powers divine is free from toil. Seated on his holy throne, unmoved in mysterious ways, he accomplishes his will. So let him look upon human outrageousness in what way it shoots up men in their wooing of us sprouted from thoughts of evil intent, having a frenzied purpose as its irresistible spur and deluded turning its thoughts towards folly. Such piteous strains of woe I utter in my pain, now shrill, now deep, blended with falling tears. Alas, alas, 
groans appropriate to funeral nails. Though I live, I chant my own dirge. I invoke Apia's hilly land for well, a land you understand my barbarous speech. And many times I lay my hands upon my Sidonian veil and tear its linen fabric to shreds. Sacrifices in satisfaction of vows are given freely to the gods, to the gods when all fares well, if only there be escape from death. Alas, alas, perplexing troubles. Where will this wave of trouble bear me away? I invoke Apia's hilly land. For well, O oh land, you understand my barbarous speech. And many times I lay my hands upon my Sidonian veil and tear its linen fabrics to shreds. Our oars indeed and our timbered ship bound with yellow rope to withstand the sea sped me on by helping of favoring winds unharmed by all tempests, nor have I reason for complaint. But may the all-seeing father establish a kindly issue in due time, that the mighty descendants of our honorable mother escape the embrace of man, ah, me. unwedded, unvanquished. And may Zeus's pure daughter, she who holds securely the sacred wall, willingly, meeting my will, look upon me, and grieve that our pursuit come with all her might, a virgin to a virgin's aid, to deliver me that the mighty descendants of our honorable mother may escape the embrace of a man. Ah, me. Unwedded, unvanquished. Oh, Zeus, on account of the poisonous hate of Io, vengeance from the gods pursues us. I know your consort's sky conquering spite, for a stormy sea follows a harsh wind. And Zeus shall then be liable to the charge of injustice that he hates the child of the heifer, the child who he himself begat long ago, his very own, and now he holds his face averted from our prayers. May he from above hear our call. Ah, Zeus, on account of the poisonous hate of Io, vengeance from the gods pursues us. I know your consort's sky conquering spite, for a stormy sea follows a harsh wind. My children, you must be prudent. A prudent captain of your voyage was your reliable old father here with whom you came. I see dust, the voiceless herald of an army. The axle driven wheels are not silent in their sockets. I behold a throng armed with shields and holding spears with steeds and curved chariots. Perhaps they are the princes of the land come to look on us, informed by messengers. But whether a harmless man or one driven by savage wrath rouses this expedition, it is better, damsels, in any case, to seat yourselves at that man mound sacred to the assembled gods. Stronger than a castle is an altar, an impenetrable shield, as quick as you can, gather in your left hands your white wreathed suppliant boughs, sacred emblems of Zeus the Merciful. Reply to the strangers as is fitting for foreigners, in piteous and plaintive language of necessity, telling them clearly of your flight, how it was unstained by deed of blood. Above all, let no arrogance accompany your speech and reveal nothing impious in your peaceful eyes from your respectful face. In your speech, neither interrupt nor hesitate, for this would offend these people. And remember to be submissive. You are an alien, a fugitive and in need. Bold speech does not suit the weak. Father, your words are prudent and may they fall on prudent ears. I will take heed of your wise words and hold them in memory. May Zeus, the author of our people, behold us. May he indeed behold you and with a gracious eye. O oh, Zeus, have pity upon our troubles, lest we are ruined. If he wishes it so, all will end well. Invoke now that bird of Zeus. 
We invoke the saving beams of the sun. Pure Apollo, too, who, though a god, was exiled once from heaven. Knowing our lot, he may well have pity on mortals. May he have pity, indeed, and stand by ready to defend. Whom further of these divinities must I invoke? I behold a trident here, the token of its god. Well did he send us here, and well may he receive us in this land. Here too is Hermes, according to the Hellenic custom. May he then announce good tidings to the free. Honour to the mutual altar of all these protecting powers, and seat yourselves on holy ground like a flock of doves in dread of hawks of the same feathered tribe kindred, yet foes who would defile their people. If bird prey on bird, how can it be pure? And how can man be pure, who would seize from an unwilling father unwilling brides? For such an act, not even in Hades after death, shall he escape arraignment for outrage. There, also among the dead, so men tell, another Zeus holds the last judgment upon misdeeds. Take heed and reply in this manner that victory may attend your cause. From where comes this band we address? Clothed in foreign attire and luxuriating in closely woven and barbaric robes. For your apparel is not that of women of Argos, nor yet of any part of Hellas. How have you gained courage thus fearless to come to this land, unheralded and friendless and without guides? You have not spoken falsely about our clothing, but for my part, how am I to address you? As commoner, as spokesman, bearer of the sacred wand, or as ruler of the realm? As for that, answer and speak to me with confidence. For I am Pelagus, offspring of Polython, whom the earth brought forth and lord of this land. The ground where we stand is Apian land itself and has borne the name since iniquity in honor of a healer. For Apis, seer and healer, the son of Apollo, came from Nepoctis on the farther shore and purified this land of monsters deadly to man, which earth, defiled by the pollution of bloody deeds of old, calls to spring up plays charged with wrath and omnibus colony of swarming serpents. Of these plagues, Apius worked the cure by sorcery and spells to the content of the Argive land, and for the reward thereafter earned for himself remembrance in prayers. Now that you have my testimony, declare your lineage and speak further, yet our people do not take pleasure in long discourse. Our tale is brief and clear. Argives we claim to be by birth, offspring of a cow blessed in its children. And the truth of this I shall confirm in full. Strangers, what you say is hard to believe. That you are of Argive descent. It is hard to believe because you look rather more like Libyan women and not at all like women from our lands. The Nile might breed such fruit as you. Your Cypriot appearance resembles the image made by men stamping the images of women on coins. I hear that they are nomadic women of India, dwelling besides the Ethiopians who ride horse-like camels through the land. If you held bows, I would have compared your appearance to rather to the unwed carnivorous Amazons. But I would rather better understand this solution if I were instructed how your descent and seed are Argive. Is there a report that once in this land of Argos, Aya was the ward of Hera's house? Certainly she was, the tradition prevails far and wide. And is there some story too that Zeus was joined in love with a mortal? The entanglement was not secret from Hera. What then was the result of this royal strife? The goddess of Argos transformed the woman into a cow. And while she was a horned cow, did Zeus not approach her? So they say, making his form that of a bull lusting for a mate. What answer then did Zeus's stubborn consort give? She placed the all-seeing one to stand watch over the cow. What manner of all-seeing herdsmen with a single duty do you mean? Argos, son of Earth, whom Hermes slew. What else did she contrive against the unfortunate cow? A sting, torment of cattle, constantly driving her on. It drove her by a long course out of the land. 
Ah. Your account agrees with mine in all respects, and Zeus begot a son by the touching of his hand. Who is it, then, that claims to be the cow Zeus begotten calf? A Paphis, and truly named from the laying on of hands. And who was begotten of a Paphis? Libya, who reaps the fruit of the largest portion of the earth. What offspring, then, did Libya have? Agenor was her first child born. And who was his offspring? Belus, who had two sons and was the father of my father here. Now tell me his wisely given name. Danaeus, and he has a brother with 50 sons. Reveal his name on grudgingly. Aegyptus, and now that you know my ancient lineage, I pray you to help a band that is archived by the descent. I think you indeed have some share in this land of old. But how did you bring yourself to leave the home of your fathers? What stroke of fortune befell you? Lord of the Pelasgians, of varying color are the ills of mankind, and nowhere can you find trouble of the same plume. For who dreamed that a kindred people sprung of old would thus in unexpected flight find haven at Argos, fleeing in terror through loathing of the marriage bed. Why have you come as suppliants of the gods congregated here, holding in your hands those white wreathed, fresh plucked boughs? So as not to be made slave to the Aegyptus' descendants. By reason of hatred, or do you speak of unlawfulness? Who would purchase their lords from among their kin? In this way, families have enhanced their power. And it is easy then, if things go ill, to separate from a wife. How then am I to deal with you in accordance with my sacred duty? By not surrendering us at the demand of Aegyptus's sons. A serious request to take upon myself a dangerous war. Show reverence for the ship of state thus crowned. I shrink as I gaze upon the shaded shrines. Yet heavy is the wrath of Zeus, God of the suppliant. Son of Polycthon, Lord of the Pelasgians, hear me with a benign heart. Behold me, your suppliant, a fugitive, running around like a heifer chased by wolves upon precipitous crags, where confident in his help, she loathes to tell the herdsmen of her distress. I see a company of assembled gods ascending beneath the shade of fresh plucked boughs. Nevertheless, may this affair of claimants to the friendship of our city bring no mischief in its wake and let no feud come upon the state from causes unforeseen or unforestalled, for the state has no need of such trouble. Indeed, may justice, daughter of Zeus the apportioner, justice who protects the suppliant, look upon our flight that it bring no mischief in its wake. It is not mine own house at whose hearth you sit. If the state is stained by pollution in its commonality, in common let the people strive to work out the cure. For myself, I will pledge no promise before I have communicated these events to all citizens. You are the state. You are the people. Being subject to no judge, you rule the altar. Your country's hearth by your will's sole ordinance. And enthroned in sole sovereignty, you determine every issue. Beware pollution. Pollution on my enemies. But without harm, I do not know how to help you. Look to him who looks down from above. To him, the guardian of mortals, sore distress, who appealed to their neighbors yet do not obtain the justice that is their right. The wrath of Zeus, the suppliant's god, remains and will not be softened by a sufferer's complaints. If the sons of Aegyptus have authority over you by the law of your country, claiming that they are nearest of kin, who would wish to contest it? You must plead in accordance with the laws of the land you have fled, that they have no authority over you. Never. Oh, never may I fall subject to the power and authority of these men. I am determined to flee to escape this marriage that offends my soul, piloting my course by the stars. Take justice as your ally, 
and rendered judgment for the cause deemed righteous by the gods. The judgment is not easy. Do not make me the judge. I have declared that already. Though I am ruler, I will not do this thing without the consent of my people. Lest after, if any evil befell, the people should say you honored aliens and brought ruin upon your own land. Kindred to both in blood, Zeus surveys both sides alike in this dispute with an impartial scale, apportioning as is due to the wicked their wrongdoing and to the godly their works of righteousness. When these things are thus equally balanced, why do you fear to act justly? Surely there is need of deep and sultry counsel, need for a keen-sighted eye not confused to descend like some diver into the depths, that to the state above all things this matter may not work mischief, but may end well for us, that strife may not seize you upon its prize, nor yet that we surrender you from the seas that of sanctuary, and bring upon ourselves the dire abiding vengeance of the all-destroying God, who even in the realm of death does not set his victims free. Take counsel, and as is your sacred duty, prove yourself our sacred champion. Do not betray the fugitive who has been impiously cast out and driven from afar, and see me not ravage from this sanctuary of many gods, O oh, you who hold sovereign power over the land, recognize men's wantonness and guard against wrath. I must take upon myself a mighty war against one side or the other. There is no result without grievous hurt. Now when goods are plundered from a homestead, other goods may come by grace of Zeus, guardian of household wealth. As a tongue that has shot arrows beside the mark, one speech may be the healer of another, but to avoid the shedding of kindred blood, surely there is need of sacrifice that many a victim fall to many a gods as a deliverance from impending harm. For truly it is to my undoing that I have come into this quarrel. And yet I prefer to be unskilled rather than practice in the lore of foretelling ill. But may my judgment delight itself and all go well. Here now, the end of my appeals for compassion. I hear, say on, it shall not escape me. I have breast bands and girdles to gather up my robes. Such things are proper, no doubt, for women. And these then be sure I have a beautiful instrument. If you will not give some pledge to this group. What will the contrivance of the sashes do for you? To adorn these images with tablets of strange sort. Your words are riddling. Come, explain in simple speech. To hang ourselves from the statues of these gods. I detect a threat that is a lash upon my heart. You have grasped my intention, for I have cleared your vision. And on many sides there are difficulties hard to wrestle with. For, like a flood, a multitude of illness bursts on me. It is a sea of ruin, fathomless and unimpassable which I am launched upon, and nowhere is there a haven from distress. For should I pay the debt due to you, the pollution you name is beyond all range of speech. Yet if I take my stand before the walls and try the issue of battle with the sons of Aegyptus, your kinsmen, how will the cost not mount to a cruel prizeman's blood to stain the ground for women's sake? And yet the wrath of Zeus, whose guards the suppliant compels my reverence, for supreme among mortals is the fear of him. Aged father of these maidens, take these boughs straightway in your arms and place them upon other altars of the country's gods that all the natives may see the sign that you have come in suppliance. Hello. And welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen here with the Center for Hellenic Studies and Out of Chaos Theater uh, to bring you this week's uh, play by Aeschylus, The Suppliants. I'm here with our wonderful actors, Tamika Chavis, Tabitha Gale, David Rubin, Damien Jermaine Thompson, Argiris Safis, and our special guest, Rebecca Fudo-Kennedy. Now this week we, turn, we 
turn to one of the less often performed plays by Aeschylus, The Suppliants. It was produced in the decades after the Persian Wars and tells the flight of the Danaids, for, tells of the flight of the Danaids from Egypt to Greece to escape forced marriage to their cousins. It is in part a record of the complex foundational narratives of Greece, stories which made the Greeks king, kin to the Egyptians, Phoenicians, Persians, and more, yet it still tried to position the leading families as somehow homegrown, indigenous to the most famous cities of the time. This place themes reflect modern concerns too about immigration and migration, sexual violence, and what values we assume as part of cultural and political authority. Along with this though, we find xenophobia, misogyny, early reflections on ethnicity and culture, and a great deal of suffering due to all of these themes. At the foundation of the story is the myth of the Danaids, a tale of global fraternal strife, and how the daughters of Danaus fled marriage with their cousins, the sons of Egyptus, yet still ended up having to marry them in Greece. On their wedding night, as the traditional story goes, all but one of them used the knives their fathers had father had given them to kill their husbands. For this, they were to be punished eternally in the underworld, carrying water to fill a leaking cistern. And yet Aeschylus's play isn't about that. It's in the run-up to the marriage. The scene is Argos. Danaus has led his daughters there from Egypt. They meet Pelasgus, the king. They ask for his protection, and eventually their bridegrooms arrive. I'm happy to have Rebecca with us here today because she's talked a lot and worked a lot on this play, and um, it can help perhaps help us understand um, what's going on, why it isn't performed, and why it maybe should be. Uh, so Rebecca, if there are a few things somebody needs to know about this play, where would we start? Um, so I would start with a couple of things. Um, first off, one of the things about this play that we need to know is that um, unlike many of the other plays that we have left to us, um, and more like the Oresteia, this is the first play of what was a connected trilogy, which means that this play is only one third of the actual story. And there are two plays that we do not have <laughs> um, left to us that actually filled the story out. So in the second play, what actually happens is it that war has happened. <laughs> um, the Egyptians have won, <laughs> the sons of Aegyptus have won, um, and the daughters as part of the negotiation with, Dan oh, and Pelasgus, by the way, is killed. So when this, but when we get the war in between these two plays, we have the exact thing that King Pelasgus feared would happen if he allowed the Danaids to come into the city, which is a war ensued, he dies, we don't know how many Argives died, um, and part of the negotiation uh, that ends the war is that the um, daughters of, of Danaeus, the Danaids, will marry the Aegyptids after all, um, and then they will supposedly um, commit the murder. The third play either comes after they have committed the murder, or um, it's when we discover the murder, or they, they commit the murder, um, and it actually has a trial in it, and we're not sure who the trial is for. The trial may have been for um, the Danaids who killed their husbands, being held to account for that crime in a violation of Aphrodite, or the trial is for the one Danaid who didn't um, kill her husband. And um, at the end though, that one Danaid, Hupamnestra, and her husband, the Aegyptid Lycinius, they end up as king and queen of Argos. So I, we have to actually really think about whether this play, um, why this play isn't performed and, and, and um, how this play plays out. Um, that the, the first play that we're hearing um, discussions from today, recitations from today, and that is left to us is foreshadowing lots of bad things that are going to happen in the future. Um, and the play actually ends be with Argos with it being ruled over by a foreign king and queen. So that may actually um, explain a little bit about the dynamics um, because this play gets performed. Um, well, let me, let me tell you about a recent controversy and this will maybe explain the problem. Okay. Um, there was last year um, or the year before a, a staging, there was going to be a staging of this play at the Sorbonne. And the staging ended up getting called off after protesters found um, out that they, they saw pre-production photos of the performance that had the, the, actors, the actors performing in blackface. Um, because of course the Danaids are explicitly marked as black as are the sons of Aegyptus. And um, their acting troupe just donned um, dark, um, makeup to, to do, to, to, um, to perform these roles. One of the things that happened is that the, the response to this was that, um, many of the French said, oh, blackface and racism don't work here in France. We're not racist. That's an American problem. 
But um, in fact, there's a you know long history of racism um, and blackface in France. It goes back to the 19th century, as well as the context of the colonial um, context of France and the contemporary refugee crisis. The people who were staging the play were suggesting that they were staging the play as a way to, to draw sympathy and to show support for the refugees. But the people protesting the play because of the colonialist context um, and the colonial associations of France with North Africa and the use of blackface, that in fact, this play was going to be enacting negative um, uh, sort of uh, negative responses to, to refugees and immigrants. And given the fact that the play actually has those undertones that play out throughout the rest of the trilogy, um, I think you could interpret it either way. Yeah. Well, th so there are a couple things, definitely, we, we can talk about them before we get back to the play. So first, so two things. One, um, we'll maybe get to second, is <laughs> how the Athenian audience would have taken the women. Uh, but two, let, let's stick with the theme, let's start with ancient ethnicity, because this is something you've talked about. When I read that long passage where um, Pelasgus is describing the women, he just basically picks like, all of the women, like he goes from India all the way through Libya and Ethiopia, and just like you look like like them, right? Yeah. Um, there is something tremendously troubling about that passage. Really? <laughs> How is it figured in sort of the history of classical reception of uh, the past figuring of race? Yeah. So I want to I want us to think a couple of things. Um, about this is at first, um, Aeschylus is probably of all of the tragedians the most interested in what we would consider sort of geographic extravaganzas. Um, he loves in his plays to have these sort of discourses where we get a sort of tour of the known world. And part of that is probably playing into the fact that the world is getting bigger um, in this period in ways that it wasn't earlier. Um, so they're actually having actual contacts with these more edges of the world, the Black Sea, where the Amazon supposedly live, India through um, Achaemenid Persia, um, and in, Af in, in uh, Africa, in Egypt, um, with the uh, sort of uh, more connected trade with Egypt in this period, uh, especially as the Persians are being moved out. Um, a lot of that context is actually military context, though, through Persia, right? Um, or, but it's also major economic uh, stimulus. So we want to think about the fact that Aeschylus is putting these in because he thinks they're going to spark the interest of his audience, mm -hmm. right? There's also a little bit of a sort of orientalizing activity here where it's going to spark a sort of exotic notion <laughs> with his audience. I mean, do you think there's, I mean, is there also just a collapsing of difference, right? There's Greek. Yeah, and so I mean, he, they refer to the barbarian speech, right? This term barbarian, etc. cetera. Uh, but there's something that about every single one of those um, groups that is sponsored noted there is that these are women who in our other sources um, or cultures in our other sources where women don't behave the way that elite Athenian women are expected to behave. These are women who are more aggressive and more assertive um, and who spend time outside. <laughs> um, so that's a perfect that's a perfect segue then to my next question. So I was reading up a little bit on this play and you know, like a lot of the female characters in ancient plays, in the modern context, we read them perhaps more kindly than ancients would. Mm -hmm. um, so how threatening would have these women been on the Athenian stage? Um, and how, would have, how do you think audiences would have responded to their action as suppliants to request these rights from Pelasgus? So, so that the final bit of the scene where they threatened to hang themselves in the temple of Zeus, I think universally we can say that that would have been appalling to every single member of the audience. Right? That's a major sacrilege and they're threatening this and they are um, leveraging that as a way to um, get what they want. Um, so I would say on the first hand, um, this, this, the Athenians in this period in the 460s are not, um, they, they know they have had already in this period large groups of refugee women coming to Athens. They tend to be other Greeks. Um, Milesians, for example, um, is not uncommon. And the, there's an increase in the population of foreign women within the city. Mm. Um, so that's not something that would be entirely unusual, but there is a clear tension that is occurring in this period when this play is performed about these women, because um, in the period right before this play is performed is when we probably actually have the invention of and the sort of creation of this new um, foreign resident registration system that we call Metoikia, um, the METIC system, M-E-T-I-C. Um, and so here you have, for the first time in the history of Athens, anybody who's foreign who comes to the city has to register. Um, and, and eventually they'll have to pay a tax. 
right after, within the few years after this play is performed, they pass another anti-immigrant immigrant law, which is the what is called the Periclean Citizenship Law 451 BCE. And what that law does is that it actually means that any foreign woman who marries a citizen man, up until 451, if a foreign woman, like any of these Danaids, were to get married to a citizen man, their children would be citizens and their children could inherit property. Um, now in 451, you know, only a, about a decade after this play is performed, um, they put a, a kibosh on that. They can still get married, but their children cannot inherit. So between the, when the play is, um, be, right before the play is performed and then right after the play is performed, we have increasing restriction, restrictions on immigrate, uh, immigrants and they specifically target women, right? So there's something about women being able to come in and, and marry into and integrate into a city in this way and have their offspring become citizens that is, is scary or frightening to the Athenians. Um, I, really, I appreciate that context because it, I think it helps us read against our own inclination because when I read the play, I find myself deeply empathetic with yeah. the women. Right. And then especially, I find Pel- normal, especially in the contemporary context. Right. And Pelasgus, I was like, oh, well, he's kind of a waffling jerk. But to the ancients, they would understand when he says you need to follow the rules of your land and honor the, those marriage claims. Um, ancient audiences would have agreed with him. Yeah. And there's another tension there that I think is worth pointing out is that that whole exchange um, between the Danaids and Pelasgus, he's saying you have to honor the laws of your country, but they're actually trying to get him to avoid going to the assembly. They're like, no, you are the people, you are the king, you're the authority. And so what we actually see here as well is a tension that the Athenians had very raw for them, which is a tension between the idea of a tyrant or an authoritarian mm. um, leader versus an assembly of the people who would get to actually sort of have a say in the city. And so the Danaids are sort of emphasizing the authoritarian side and Danaeus is saying, or Pelasgus is saying, hey guys, but I'm not, I'm not the only one who lives here and I don't get to make choices for everybody. We're more like a democracy. Right. And so you have that tension that's gonna also feed throughout. There's another way in which the women are, so, are othered and sort of set up as a part. And as a danger. Yeah, so um, we'll, we'll get back to you with some more questions d- between the next scenes. Um, so we, this play, because it's shortened, it's fragmentary in parts, we only have a thousand lines, so we'll get to see most of it today. And the part that we're skipping out on, um, Danaus departs and King Pelasgus instructs his daughters to stick close to the image of the gods. Um, with some more reassurance, he leaves to make his case to the Argive people. The chorus then sings to Zeus to remember their ancestor, Io to ask him to have mercy. Um, And then they do what Rebecca was talking about, which is to retrace some of the geographical movements in the world as they go through Io's um, journey um, in their verses. They conclude with a passage that reflects on the will and all encompassing, uh, encompassing power of Zeus. He does not sit upon his throne by mandate of another and holds his dominion beneath a a mightier. No one sits above him whose power he holds in awe. He speaks and it is done. He hastens to execute whatever his counseling mind can see. And then we'll go to the next scene. Be of good cheer, my children. All goes well on the part of the citizens. Decrees carrying full authority have been passed. Hail, our envoy, harbinger of tidings most welcome. But tell us, to what end has the decision been carried? And to what course does the majority of the people's votes incline? Action was taken by the Argives, not by any doubtful vote, but in such a way as to make my aged heart renew its youth. For the air bristled with right hands held aloft, as in full vote they ratified this resolution into law, that we are settlers in this land and are free, subject to no seizure and secure from robbery of man, that no one, native or alien, lead us captive. But if they turn to violence, any landholder who refuses to rescue us should both forfeit his rights and suffer public banishment. Such was the persuasive speech that the King of the Pelasgians delivered on our behalf, uttering the solemn warning that never in the future should the city feed the great wrath of Zeus, protector of the suppliant, and declaring that should a twofold defilement of strangers and from natives at once arise before the city, it would become 
fodder for distress past all relief. Hearing these words, the Argive people waiting for no pro proclamation of Cryer voted by uplifted hand that this should be so. Come, let us invoke blessings upon the Argives in return for blessings. And may Zeus, God of strangers, behold the offerings of gratitude voiced by strangers' lips, that they may in true fulfillment reach their perfect goal. Divinely born gods, hear now as I pour forth libations for blessings upon our kindred. Never may the wanton lord of war, insatiate of battle cry, Ares, who reaps a human harvest in alien fields, destroy this Pel Pelasgian land by fire, for they had compassion for us, and, and cast a vote in our favor, respecting our pitiable flock in the name of Zeus. Nor did they cast their votes for the side of the males, disregarding the women's cause, since they honored the avenging eye of Zeus, against which there is no battling, and what house would have it defiling its roof? For he sits heavily upon it. They take reverent heed of their ken, petitioners of holy Zeus. Therefore, with pure altars shall they please the gods. Therefore, let there fly forth from our overshadowed lips a prayer of gratitude. Never may pestilence empty this city of its men, nor strife stain the soil of the land with the blood of slain inhabitants. But let the flower of its youth be unplucked, and may Ares, the partner of Aphrodite's bed, he who makes havoc of men, not shear off their bloom. And may the altars where the elders gather blaze in honor of venerable men. Thus may their state be regulated well if they hold in awe the mighty Zeus. And most of all, Zeus, the warden of the guest, who by venerable enactment guides destiny straight. We pray that the other guardians always be renewed and that Artemis Hecate watch over the childbirth of their women. And let no murderous havoc come upon the realm to ravage it by arming Ares, foe to the dance and loot, parent of tears and the shout of civil strife. And may the joyous swarm of diseases settle far from the heads of the inhabitants. And to all the young people, may Lysias be graciously, graciously disposed. May Zeus cause the earth to bring forth its tribute of fruit by the produce of every season. May their grazing cattle in the fields have abundant increase, and may they obtain all things from the heavenly powers. May the people who control the state guard its privileges free from fear, a prudent government counseling wisely for the public prosperity. And should they have recourse to arms, may they inflict no loss but grant just rights of covenant to the stranger within their gates. I commend these sensible prayers, dear children, but do not be troubled yourselves when you hear the unexpected and startling tidings your father has to tell. From my post of lookout here on the Sanctuary of Suppliants, I see that ship, for it is well marked and does not escape me, the trimming of its sail, its side guards, and the prow that with its eye scans its onward course, obeying all too well for those to whom it is unfriendly, the guiding rudder at the stern. The rest of the ships, the rest of the ships, and all the assisting fleet stand in clear view, but the leading ship herself has furled her sail and draws near the shore with full sweep of sounding oars, Yet you must face the matter calmly and with self-control and not be unmindful of these gods. For my part, I will secure allies and advocates to urge our cause and return. Father, I am afraid. With what swift wings the ships approach? There's much, not much time left. Since the vote of the Argives was final, be of good cheer, my children. They will fight in your defense. I know this well. Abominable are the lustful descendants of Aegyptus and the satiate of battle. And you know that all too well. In ships, stout timbered and dark proud, they have sailed here and in their wrath overtaken us. Do not leave me forlorn. I implore you, Father. 
A woman abandoned to herself is nothing. There is no Ares in her. They are all evil mind and guileful of purpose with impure hearts, thinking no more of altars than carry-on birds. This would profit us well, my children, should they incur both heaven's hate and yours. Father, no fear of tridents or of things held sacred in the sight of heaven will ever stop their hands from us. They're overweening, maddened with unholy rage, shameless dogs that do not respect the gods. Yet there is a saying that wolves are stronger than dogs. Since they have the tempers of lewd and impious beasts, we must guard against them quickly. A fleet in getting underway is not so speedy, nor yet in anchoring when the securing cables must be brought ashore. And even at anchorage, shepherds of ships do not feel immediately secure, above all if they have arrived on a harbourless coast when the sun is sinking into night. Then, too, the disembarking of an army cannot be effected with success before a ship has gained confidence in her moorings. But for all your terror, remember not to neglect the gods. I will return when I have secured aid. The city will find no fault with a messenger old in years, but with youth in his heart and on his tongue. So that scene leaves us at sort of a moment of transition in the play. We don't know if the uh, sons of Egyptus are going to show up, and it seems like the suppliant women have gotten what they were aiming to get. Um, Rebecca, what do you? What can we make of the city voting for the women and the general tone of the play, sort of taking their side at this point? Am I reading it wrong, or are we being? How are we being set up here? Yeah. So um, I mean, obviously the the. If we listen to the words of the Danaids, they're very excited, right? They say, oh, it's so exciting. They took the woman's side, right? Um, this idea, so, so I think we have to think about um, their opposition to the marriage as sort of rolled into this thing. Um, their opposition to the marriage is not actually something like Pala um, King Pelasgus has a hard time understanding it because in, in the Athenian context or in a broader Greek context, the idea that young women will be married off to their kin in this way is not, not unusual, right? Um, and so their resistance to marriage is sort of a strange thing. And this is why they um, threatened to kill themselves in the temple. Um, that's an extreme manifestation of what might have been considered an unusual resistance on their part to marriage. So they themselves also seem surprised <laughs> when the, the Argives vote for it. But if the Argives voted for it because they didn't want their temples polluted, um, then we can sort of see how the threat lands, right? Um, but on the other hand, um, I think we have to think also about the context in which they're putting this. They keep appealing to Zeus because Zeus is the God that you appeal to in these contexts. But Zeus is also the author of their troubles, right? Zeus rapes Io and that sort of sets off this whole cavalcade of events, right? Zeus is not exactly the God you think about as like protecting women from violence. Or protecting, you know, yeah, women from marriage or chastity, right? He's the guy who gives his brother the keys to go kidnap Persephone and, and everything. So. Um, this idea that um, he's the guy that they're appealing to, I think we might see in the archives a sort of sympathy with them because of their own connections to Io as well. And I, so I think there might be something in there where we actually see um, them saying, they took Io from us, we're going to accept them back. And this sort of protectiveness of, of women, because the important thing is that the whole first exchange is about whether or not the Danaids get to be considered um, Greek or not, or Argive or not. And once they are declared Argive, what you now have is foreign men coming to take Greek women's bodies. Right. And so that's a different context. And that's no, no different really than Io being kidnapped and taken away, um, this foreign body coming and taking a Greek body. They've designated them as Argives. So they have to protect them from this, what is now set up as a foreign rape scenario. So I, and I mean, there's so much I want to say about that, but maybe we'll leave it for after because yeah. it's dizzying this sort of trouble they go to, to establish themselves as being Greek, but then they're not right. Um, but one of the, the, the characters I have a lot of hard, uh, uh, hard time understanding in this play is Danaus, right? He's their father in sort of an Athenian Greek context. He should be their advocate and fighting for them in a different way. He seems sort of strangely passive and oddly distant 
Um, am I misreading him? Uh, what's going on with him in this book? <laughs> so I have a theory, and this is not, um, I, I, I published this theory uh, back in 2014 in my Immigrant Women book, and I haven't gotten a lot of adherence yet. Okay. But part of the reason is because we don't have the rest of the play. But I have a theory that he actually rejects the marriage with the Aegyptids, <laughs> the sons of Aegyptus, in order to set himself up to go over and become king in Argos. Yeah. Uh, and so I think he is slow playing himself. Um, we have the lines in the play where he's the architect of their behavior. He, t- he um, tutors them and sort of coaches them on how to act and how to be Greek enough, right? And how to sort of gain um, the- Because right, he keeps advising them- Of the army, uh, yeah. of the Argives. Because if he marches in and says, hi, I'm a descendant from Io and I'm a king, you know, my brother's king and I can't be king and I have these 50 daughters, <laughs> I think it's a different scenario. They're going to be less welcoming, I think. And, and so, I mean, they, then he, they're just instruments to him. I, I, I think so, because I think the way that that ends up playing out is he ends, ends up marrying them off to the sons of Aegyptus anyway, um, in order to affect his own... In- and some of his yeah. advice to them is it, it can be a little disturbing in any context, right? He's like, don't don't dress like you got to dress nicely, cover up, don't sleep with people, like be careful how you speak. I yeah, mean, and, and I don't want to like spoil the end, but like um, there's a lot of talk about their flowers, uh, their flowering, the, the fruit section, the fruit sections, uh, right? Um, and I think that he's both at the same time. He's, he's highlighting the fact that they are marriageable. He just doesn't want them to be marriageable to the sons of Aegyptus. Yeah, well, he, want, he wants to control it. Yeah. But he wants to control who they marry. And very importantly, he wants them to marry Greeks. So we're going to come back to the topic of Greekness and this sort of international relationships we have going on a- after the final scene. Um, but what happens in the brief scene that we skip um, is that the chorus sings about the terror and revulsion at the prospect of capture, because it's more than capture, it's rape, it's violence, and it's a lifetime of it because it's also a marriage. They wish themselves away into the air, to the earth, or into death, and then we get to our final set of scenes for the day. Away with you, away to the ship as fast as your feet can carry you. If you want, your hair shall be torn out, you'll be pricked with goads, and off will come your heads with abundant letting of gory blood. Away with you, away and curses on you. Would that you had perished on your course over the great briny flood, along with your lordly arrogance and your riveted ship. I order you to stop your shrieking, Leave the sanctuary, be off to the ship. I do not respect one without honor and city. Never again may my eyes behold the cattle nurturing stream from which increase comes to men and vigor of the blood of life. I am a native here of ancient nobility. You will get yourself speedily on board. On board, I say, whether you will or not by force wail and shout and call upon the gods, you will not escape the Egyptian ship. Alas, alas, the brutal outrage with which you crocodile, you boast arrogantly, bellowing on the sea. May the mighty Nile who watches you overwhelm your arrogance and destroy you. Go to the double proud ship as quickly as possible. Let no one delay for dragging by force has no mercy on locks of hair. Alas, Father, the help of the sacred images deludes me. Oh, oh, Mother Earth, Mother Earth, avert his fearful cries. Oh, Father Zeus, son of Earth, he rages close to me. The two-footed serpent, like some viper, he lays hold on me and bites my foot. Alas, alas, Mother Earth, Mother Earth, avert his fearful cries. Oh, fearful Zeus, Father, son of the Earth. If you will not resign yourself and get to the ship, Rending will have no pity on the fabric of your garments. We are lost. Oh, King, we are suffering impious violence. Oh, you will soon see many kings in Egyptian sons. Be of good cheer, you will not have to blame lack of government. Listen, 
chiefs and rulers of the city, I am threatened with violence. You there, what are you doing? What kind of arrogance has incited you to do such dishonor to the realm of Parisian men? Indeed, do you think you have come to a land of women? Many are the misses of your wits, and your hits are none. And in this case, where have I gone wrong and transgressed my right? First of all, you do not know how to act as a stranger. I not know? How so? When I simply find and take my own that I had lost? To what patrons of your land was your notice given? To Hermes, the searcher, greatest of patrons. For all your notice to the gods, you do not do them reverence. I revere the deities by the Nile. While ours are nothing, as I understand you? Uh, I shall carry off these maids unless someone tears them away. If you so much as touch them, you will regret it. And right soon. I hear you. And your speech is far from hospitable. I will go and tell Egypt's sons about this. But that I may know and tell a plainer tale, for it is fitting that a herald make exact report on its detail. What message am I to deliver? Who is it am I to tell on my return that he has despoiled me of this band of women, their own cousins? My name. <laughs> Why should I tell you? In due course of time, you will learn it, you and your companions. As for these maids, if convinced by God-faring argument, they consent of their own free will and heartily, you may take them. But to this purpose, I decree has been passed by the unanimous resolve of the people of the state, never under compulsion to surrender this association of women. Through their resolve, the rivet has been driven home to remain fixed and fast. I think we're about to involve ourselves in new war. But may victory and authority rest with the men. It is men, I believe, you will find in the dwellers of this land. But take courage, all of you. And together with your handmaids, proceed to our well-fenced town and encircled by sturdy devices of towers. A protector you have in me and in all the inhabitants, whose resolve to this that now takes effect. Why wait for others of higher authority? In blessings may you abound, noble Pelasgian, in requital for your blessings. But if it pleases you, send our brave father, Danaeus, here to be our advisor and leader of our councils. My children, it is right to offer prayers to the Argives and to sacrifice and pour libations to them as to Olympian gods, for they are our saviors in no doubtful manner. They heard from my lips the conduct of your cousins toward their own kinfolk and were moved to bitterness against them. But to me they assigned this escort of spearmen that I might have rank and honor and might not be ambushed and perish by the death of a spear. And so an ever-living burden come upon the land. Recipients of such favors as these, it becomes us to hold gratitude in yet higher honor from the bottom of our hearts. And in addition to the many other wise injunctions of your father recorded in your memory, inscribe this too, that an unknown company is proved by time. For in an alien's case, all the world bears an evil tongue in readiness. And it is easy lightly to utter defiling slander. Therefore, I would have you bring no shame upon me. Now, when your youthful loveliness attracts men's gaze, the tender ripeness of summer fruit is in no way easy to protect. Beasts despoil it, and men, why not? 
and brutes that fly, and those that walk the earth. Love's goddess spreads the news abroad of fruit bursting ripe. So, all men as they pass, mastered by desire, shoot an alluring arrow of the eye at the delicate beauty of the virgins. See to it, therefore, that we do not suffer that in fear for which we have endured great toll, toil and ploughed the great waters with our ship and that we bring no shame to ourselves and exaltation to our enemies. May the Olympian gods grant us good fortune in all the rest, but concerning the bloom of my virginity, father, be of good cheer. For unless some evil has been devised of heaven, I will not swerve from the former pathway of my thoughts. Come now away, glorifying the blessed gods, lords of the city, both those who guard the town and those who dwell about Erasmus's ancient stream. And you, handmaidens, take up the song. Let the theme of our praise be this city of the Pelasgians, and no longer let the homage of our hymns be paid to Nile's floods, where they seek the sea, but to the rivers that pour their gentle draught through, throughout the land and increase the birth of the children, soothing its soil with their fertile screams, streams. May pure Artemis look upon this band in compassion, and may marriage never come through Cytheria's compulsion. May that prize belong to my enemies. May sovereign Zeus spare me cruel marriage with a man I hate, that very Zeus who mercifully freed Io from pain, restoring her with healing hand by kindly force. So we're left sort of in action in the middle, as Rebecca was saying, unsure what would, was going to happen. An ancient audience wouldn't have to wait so long. Um, Rebecca, before we turn to some more questions and the actors, um, can, can you tell me, can you help me understand a little bit about sort of the journey of identity that goes on in this play? Um, because this is an attempt to make the Danaids Greek but to ensure that their brothers, their brothers, their future husbands stay not Greek. Their cousins. <laughs> their cousins stay not Greek. Um, and all this is in the background where we're in the stage in Athens showing how other Greek cities are related to all these foreign people um, and then making these decisions about, you know, who matters as a person and not, right? Who counts as a citizen? Um, can we disentangle this a bit? I mean, it seems really hard for me to get my head around it. Um, yeah, so it is It is super hard um, to get our heads around, um, but I think we should start with uh, just sort of pulling on some of the different threads that we have here. So the first one is the Danaids' own journey, right? So the Danaids start off as being um, completely other. They are fierce women, they're savage, they, have, um, they dress very foreign, right? Um, they have black skin, um, they speak a language that supposedly is hard to understand, um, but they go in a short stretch of the play from having that um, alienation from Pelascus, King Pelascus, to being ex admitted to being um, Argive and through that Greek. Um, I say, I, I almost wanna put Greek in quotation marks though, because th this is a period of time where what it means to be Greek or Hellenic as the Greeks called themselves um, is actually really fraught because Everybody wants all the Greeks to think of themselves as Greeks together, but they're constantly at war with each other and they do exclude each other from access to their to, to benefits and rights within their different independent cities. Um, so there are moments of time where they actually unite as Greeks, but for the most part, they operate in their everyday lives as if other Greeks are foreigners to them. And so, uh, and that's what the Athenians are doing right at this moment, right? They're, they're weeding out people who are Greek, but not Athenian. Um, from access to rights and benefits. And that's actually the word that is used that gets translated as alien in this play um, by Smythe is actually the word metic. <laughs> um, and it's one of the earliest uses of this word that we actually have, which is resident foreigner. Um, and so that's how they're gonna be given rights and benefits into the city, um, not as um, people who have full rights within the city. Um, and so their, their journey actually takes them from being completely recognized, not recognized as foreign to being recognized as at least Greek, <laughs> right? Um, and maybe accessible in that way. 
Then we have the way that they do that though, which is to actually shave themselves off from the Aegyptids. So the Aegyptids have the same exact descent as they do, <laughs> right? But, but what the Aegyptids don't have is an understanding of cultural practice. And I think what we're seeing here is a moment in um, the history of um, our ways of thinking about identity in ancient Greece, where we're seeing a moment where we're moving away from the sort of aristocratic descent-based ideas of how you gain your, your, your identity towards more of a cultural definition. Greeks um, themselves, they define themselves in many ways as united through cultures, uh, certain shared cultural elements. And so I think you see that happening. And I think that's one of the things that's really remarkable about this play in terms of um, how it might've been we, we fixate on the fact that the, the skin color of the Danaids is black. Um, and within the play that disappears very briefly because cultural action, sort of the ability to act and perform Greekness tends to overtake that. Whereas with the Egyptians um, in parts of the play that aren't here, their blackness is actually emphasized. And I'm using blackness here with a lowercase b because I don't want us to confuse that or conflate that with a modern identity category, um, but they are called um, black in the, in the play. Um, that blackness gets emphasized um, because when the Herald comes in and performs his re re interactions with Pelasgus, he cannot perform proper Greekness. What I find really powerful about, about the way you described it, um, Rebecca, is we really see evidence here for the development of a sense of ethnicity or identity um, based around political power as Athens is moving into its imperial stage. Right? And this is something that we often lose sight of is that the Athenians defined who mattered based on what was of material advantage to them. And then later on, they could kill, they could isolate based on that. So people we would recognize as Greeks, like the family of Lysias, right, could be murdered and their money could be taken. Well, well, not only that, but um, so if you are and, and someone is asked on YouTube the word for resident foreigner, it's metic, M-E-T-I-C. Um, the, um, the penalties, if you didn't register for this system, this registration system, was that you could be sold into enslavement. So your freedom is in fact um, conditional <laughs> once you enter into the city and you enter into this status. Um, so this is a big deal. <laughs> um, and if you are caught pretending to be a citizen, right, if you're caught pretending to be a citizen, you can be sold into enslavement. So um, these are Gre Greeks willing to sell other Greeks into enslavement, um, which really shows the sort of um, difficulties and problematics of these categories. And I think one of the biggest issues that happens too is that um, when we read, our, we read ourselves back into these plays and we read our world back into these plays, we have this overwhelming um, sympathy for the refugee women, I think in part because of the modern context of the last decade in particular. Um, with the refugee crisis. Um, and I think there would have been Athenians in the audience who would have felt that way as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's a world where um, uh, things are just a little bit less clear. Um, and I think that we seeing the anti-immigrant immigrant reactions of people who are having these um, families and women come into their lands, I think that's there in those plays as well, uh, in that play as well. I, li I like the, the emphasis that's really powerful is that Athens changes, right? When people saw this play, many of them would have had a memory of being refugees, of abandoning the city of Athens for Salamis and elsewhere and watching their homes burn. But somehow over the next decade, it changes so that people who came to them as refugees couldn't belong. But so you I'm also have to remember that in that same period, we're having large scale, certain refugees are welcome. And we're going to have certain refugee groups who are going to be given special status um, because like the Plataeans, when they come into the city, because they fought beside the Athenians at, um, you know, at Marathon, <laughs> things like this. I think one of the things we just want to really be ca cautious about both as in, as in today and in the past, audiences aren't monoliths. Right. And when we say Athenians, we don't mean Greeks, generally speaking. And when we even say Athenians, we can't account for the fact that there are people in the audience whose husbands and wives were at some point immigrants, potentially. Right. Their children, um, you know, they, they married their, themselves off to, they're married to an immigrant. Um, so there's, there's a lot of difference um, in an audience and a lot of different audience responses. So and this, so now we can move to some other responses because this does bring up a lot. And I'm happy today that we have with us um, Roshni Chakraborty, who's doing work with um, refugees. Um, Roshni, would you unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about your response to the play and how it relates to some of the work you've been doing? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, congratulations. It was fantastic. Um, really enjoyed watching it. Um, I think it, this play is super interesting because, um, so I think the play echoes a lot of the sentiments that we've been seeing uh, right now, but in some ways it is also revolutionary. So one thing that I found interesting was that here, the grounds for seeking asylum were basically gender-based violence. They were fleeing forced marriage, right? They were fleeing violence from men um, in Egypt. And even today in our refugee convention, we do not recognize gender-based violence as grounds for seeking asylum. So you could be fleeing like, uh, and seeking asylum on uh, grounds of female genital mutilation, and you still wouldn't count as a refugee. So I think in some ways, this is far ahead of even our times. But in other ways, it's, you know, the same tropes come up of, for example, the conversation that you and Rebecca were talking about, about the control of female sexuality. Female sexuality is just such a threat to the nation state because it's women who reproduce the state biologically, culturally, symbolically. So by controlling females, you're essentially controlling the future of nationhood, right? And um, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, that's one of the reasons that rape is, such, is so common during conflicts. You know, during the partition of India, for example, women were abducted from either side and then impregnated. And that was a way to sort of assert the superiority of your own ethnicity and religion. And you can see some echoes of that in this play where the Greeks were definitely trying to show that they were culturally and morally superior, right? Because they were protecting the women. They were like standing up for them when the place that they were coming from did not. So that is an interesting uh, parallel. The other thing that I would say is that I found fascinating was just this idea that you have a responsibility, that the citizens of that state voted to take the women in, um, which I, in today's world, I think there are very few countries in which if we had a democratic vote, they would vote to take refugees in. Um, and, you know, the interesting part is that we've recognized this principle of responsibility. We've recognized that we cannot send refugees back to states where they fear persecution. It's enshrined in our laws, but people have been trying to find ways to shirk that responsibility. So Greece, for example, in the last few months has gotten into a lot of trouble because what it's been doing is literally ignoring distress signals at sea. Because if you see the boat, you have a responsibility to bring the boat home. You have a responsibility to at least process their claims for asylum. But if you don't see the boat and you go the other way, you don't have to do that. So we're trying to find loopholes around it, but underlying that sort of is still this idea that we do have a responsibility. Now, with when it comes to female refugees in particular, I think it's so interesting because in this play, we're talking about the it's we're talking about seeking help and receiving help, but it never comes from a place of having the right to seek or receive help. Constantly, Daenerys keeps using the language of you know don't forget to be submissive because you're an alien, you're a woman, so remember your place and be grateful that you're getting this. It doesn't come from a place of rights. And that's one thing that I've seen in my work uh, in refugee camps as well. So a lot of the women just feel like they should be grateful for whatever they have got. We shouldn't be asking for too much or making too much of yourself because that might jeopardize other things. So one case that's, you know, one thing that's extremely disturbing is that Female refugees rarely ever leave their husbands, even in cases of extreme domestic abuse. They rarely report cases because they feel that might jeopardize their legal status, because they feel that that somehow is going to have a bearing on what else they can ask for. So that's a, a major concern. And especially during COVID, I think this right to ask for help has been completely disrupted. Because we, for the last couple of decades, we've had states basically enforcing dependence on aid agencies, right? If you're not giving them work permits, you're not giving people travel permits. So you're essentially forcing them to be dependent on aid organizations. But when a pandemic occurs, you don't designate them as essential services. So you've left people with no water, sanitation, with no access to medical health services, um, in many cases, internet shutdowns. So I think this right to seek and receive help is something that we really need to talk about more. And I'm glad you all put out this play and got this conversation going. Well, and I, I mean, I thank you for all of those comments because they're, they're, we have to remind ourselves of how hard things are on the other side of our walls and our borders. And one of the comments Rebecca made earlier was that what the women from Egypt do here is they threaten to defile the temples. They threaten to take their own lives. Um, and that's their trump card, right? Sorry to use that term now, right? But that is their key to victory, right? I mean, apart from universal humanism, um, what hope would you see in the world for giving refugee women, especially the power um, 
to demand the rights that they deserve as human beings? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it comes from recognizing the agency of refugee women and then allowing them to express that. And this comes in many different forms and it's obviously much harder than I'm making it sound. But, you know, a simple example is if you go onto the website of any humanitarian organization, the banner on top is likely going to feature a woman and a child because they are pictures of helplessness, right? They are people that you want to help, but you, what you're doing basically is just basic, we are putting them back into those relationships of subordination where they are the one that we are helping. So there's this power imbalance that we keep, you know, just reinforcing through all of our actions. And I think with women, especially what we, uh, the key to that is ensuring that we obviously gender mainstreaming, right? You have to ensure that women are given special provisions because they are they have less access to mobile phones. They are less digitally literate in a lot of refugee situations. So you have to ensure that you're actively going out there and making sure they have connections so that they can access GBV referral services. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know there are other very like small insidious ways in which these you know this subordination is reinforced, like the UN High Commissioner for Refugees distributes aid through heads of household. And typically when you're registering a family, uh, when you're registering a family, it's the male who's going to be the head of household. So the aid goes through the male and then to the family. So malnutrition among refugee women is a massive issue. And what happens then is maternal malnutrition is another issue. So you're producing a whole new generation of people that just is completely affected by these power relations. So I think at every step of the way, we need to be recognizing the agency of women. And you know, as I'm saying this, I am making the mistake of not doing that as well, because in so many situations, women have started up their own stalls. Um, you know, they've been running market stalls in refugee camps. They've created apps uh, to teach each, teach each other different languages. They've, I mean, they've done incredible work. You will find so many female refugee bands. So we also need to remember that they are doing stuff despite all of the barriers. So our duty is just to make sure that those barriers are lessened. Because part of the process of dehumanization is taking agency away, right? And keeping people farther away from power. Um, if, is there, if there were an organization or group you thought that we could post online to give to or to support to help some of the actions that you're talking about, um, what's one that you would suggest? And could you put it in the chat box and we'll put it online? Are there some specific groups you think are doing good work in this area? Yeah, I think it's very uh, context dependent because I think in my personal opinion, local NGOs do much better work because they have a much greater understanding of it. Um, but I think on an international scale, you have the International Rescue Committee and Save the Children who have been doing fantastic work related specifically to gender and refugees. So I can post a link for that. Um, and especially during COVID, I mean, they've been struggling because all of the funds have been redirected towards public health efforts. So. Thank yeah, you. I'm sure they would. Be. Thank you. So we'll we'll put those live or put those on YouTube, hopefully. Um, so in the time we have left, um, we can keep reflecting on these issues, but I'd like to let the actors just have their chance to respond to the play and the performance. Um, and let's start with the Danaids themselves, um, Tamika and Tabitha. What were some of your responses to the play um, and the challenges of performing it? I guess. Uh, Tamika first and then Tabitha, or Tabitha, you unmuted first, however you want to do it. Um, yeah, I unmuted. I was, I'm still completely lost in what Roshni just said. Thank you so much for your your labor and your work. Um, one, one of my first reactions was, it's amazing in this narrative that these women get to go and to speak to the, the leader of this country face to face and have, you know, the, the fullness of their humanity scene um relating that back to i guess you know the current refugees words um referring that back to current times like it's it's so easy to turn people away when you don't when they're just numbers when they're just i don't know a name from a different country just to see them have their humanity and to get to plead their case was was an experience for me. Thank you. And, and it's, a, it's a fantasy of experience, right? That I wish we could have. Um, Tamika. I, I, I honestly don't have anything to add to that. That was, um, I think that what Tabitha said, I, I concur, I second. 
Um, now, uh, the two of you played off of each other pretty well. Well, just, you know, before we go to the other actors, um, what were you thinking in inhabiting the roles of these women? Uh, what, what did you draw on and what, what are their words really resonated with you? So Tamika first on this and then Tabitha. Well, I think in, in um, playing off of each other and I, I kind of envisioned, especially when pleading to the king, us clinging to each other and, and really um, just strengthening the voice and it kind of made me feel like it's 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 easy to turn away one voice, but when it when there's a multitude of voices, it's kind of hard. And I felt that there was a strength in um, in the two of us working together to to in in pleading with the king um, to the king to help to help us and help and not turn us away. Um, so I felt that that the in us working together, tag teaming, tag teaming, um, working together to build a, to have a strong voice in pleading our case. Yeah, and it worked really well. The, Tabitha, the, uh, you, the two of you had some hard language and concepts to, to convey. Um, what, what of the content of the play surprised you compared to some of our other performances? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I was necessarily surprised with anything um, in the context of the other the performances and other readings that I've gotten to do. I think something that did stand out very clearly to me was um, Danaeus's call to be to be reserved in language, to be uh, stoic, to choose words carefully and let nothing um, nothing impure cross their eyes. And I think this just goes back to what I was saying initially before about like, you know, pleading their humanity and like being in person before someone else when their situation is so dire. Um, it's, it's do or die for them. Either, you know, this person lets them into the country and lets them stay and all of that, or they go back to unlivable circumstances. And just the idea that they would have had to, and they did in the play, they had to choose their words so carefully and to hold on to this, this, what's the word? Uh, I'm losing language here. This, uh, this facade of being put together when their situation is that dire is, it's kind of crazy to me. It's insane because they're pleading for their lives. I know. They truly are. Yeah. Actually, and, and on top of that, it's either help us, we don't want to go back, help us, or we are going to kill ourselves. Exactly. That's how right. dire it is. And that really uh, resonates with what, with what uh, Roshni was saying about, you know, the, the constrained and limited range of behavior that you have for, for refugee women, especially. Right, um, they don't. They can't mess up. The stakes are are high, and the um, room for mistake is very small. Um, so that play really struck me. So I those parts of the play, Tabitha. Like, yeah, they they can't mess up yet. They hold none of the power. Right, right. Except that one, like that that the the brutal threat. Um, mm -hmm. So this threat, in part, plays upon Damien. Damien. Um, I want to congratulate you too for your performance. This is your first time with us. And I have to say, I read, when I read Pelasgus yesterday, I was looking through the Greek and the English. I was just like, this is a mealy mouth weakling, right? But you came on and you completely convinced me that there's more depth to his character. Um, what were you thinking in trying to inhabit him? And what were some sort of his principles in your mind? Uh, um, when I first... Uh, read it to be to be honest the, the first thing that I was struck by was his language um, and his intelligence because he speaks in these I mean he has like a paragraph of text and it's all just one sentence you know so it's like it's just I mean it it's a pretty smart guy that has you know that speaks in such um, elongated terms um, but I, 
I saw a ruler that was conflicted, you know, conflicted by what society, his people would say and, and what the heavens expect of him, right? Or heavens in the sense of what morality um, expects of him, right? Um, and I, and I, I mean, that last scene where he comes in and he stops them from, from taking this thing, I think for me, that showed his power. You know, in, in, in that scene, he's, he's telling them, hey, you, you, you can't just come to my land un, unannounced, don't ask and take what you can. Even if it's yours, the minute that it gets onto my land, it's now mine, or I am in charge of it unless you ask me to give it back. Sure. And so, go, yeah, go. No, I think maybe what surprised me and challenged me so much is I'm not used to leaders being intelligent or having responsibility anymore. <laughs> yeah, 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 could, could be, could be. Um, and so from there, like I, I kind of took that authoritative way of being, even in the beginning, like when the women come, come to him, that there is this kind of like reverence and grace because he is smart enough to actually acknowledge that there are people that are greater than him, right? That there are powers that are greater than, than, than him. And, and I think that anyone who does, does that can sit in their own power and also acknowledge that of, of higher or greater. I think that's, and I thank you for bringing humanity to a character I saw as farce. Um, and I, I, again, every week this happens with the actors who bring such life to these figures who I made so flat on the page. Um, another character who's more complex than I think my brain could handle um, is David Rubin's Denaus. So David, I don't know if you heard Rebecca and I trying to make sense of you. Um, what did you think of Denaus as a father and as a figure with his own aims? Um, I'm sort of discovering it again as I go. Um, the thing that really struck me more than anything on first reading last night was how it, uh, the, the kind of contemporary parallels of it all, it kind of just felt very fresh. Um, I guess I'm still discovering the relationship with the daughters. Um, it, it, it was interesting to hear what you, what, what you were saying about the cultural uh, stuff that he's bringing to it, still keeping them submissive. Um, it's all very interesting stuff, but uh, early days for me. <laughs> well, I think, and you brought like a paternal interest to it that I think worked and it left enough ambiguity there for me to still be sort of racking my head. I resisted ripping out my hair um, only because I was well, on. My instinct was to you know, play a uh, loving father to these daughters. Yeah, that's starting point, but it kind of, it, it got wrestled away from me in certain of the speeches, uh, partly discovering uh, how dense those speeches are and, and trying to work out what it is that's happening. But there's clearly uh, not a straightforward, modern, loving father relationship with the daughters. Uh, right. So there's probably a lot more stuff to mine in that, I would think. Argyris, um, you, as the, you know, the hated Egyptian, you get to be this one person representing this whole group. Um, I, again, as with your last performance, you played it much cooler than I expected. I think it really worked because it seemed like you expected to be there and you were confident you were right. Um, is that sort of the approach you were bringing to this performance? Well, uh, actually, yes. Uh, that, that was my first, uh, my first instinct about this part. Uh, and uh, having worked in another Aeschylus play a lot recently, uh, there is a theme that uh, comes again and again uh, with Aeschylus, actually uh, making all these remarks on how other people, how the barbarians are thinking. Uh, they are not Democrats uh, for Aeschylus. Uh, and, uh, he makes all these remarks and he, uh, there is always an ironic uh, look on the, the parts that he's writing on, this, uh, on, on the barbarian. Uh, parts that uh, they don't uh, know how to discuss in a democratic way. Uh, they don't know how to make a dialogue and uh, they feel that uh, actually uh, this Egyptian guy, this Herald, uh, feels that everything it's, it's his, not only uh, the suppliants, but everything. And uh, I feel, uh, he, 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 look, look, the way he, he talks to uh, to Pelasgos. What kind of herald talks with that audacity to a king? 
it, it's you know it's uh, probably the audience would be laughing in this scene. That's that's what that's what the, uh, what I was imagining when I was thinking about it. Uh, about the themes of the play, I have to say that uh, Tabatha completely covered my thoughts, and uh, I also want to thank Roshni about her work, and I want to say that she was actually very kind describing the situation in uh, contemporary Greece. They they don't only uh, dismiss the distress signals, they started pushing people and refugees back in a very active way. And uh, I have to be honest, I'm, I'm ashamed for this kind of governance uh, because we are a country of refugees. Our parents were refugees. Uh, they went all over the world two or three times uh, because we were poor and we have to find the to find a better life and now probably we're back and now we're pushing other people uh, away it, it, it's uh, really I'm ashamed and thank you for, uh, Roshni for everything you're doing and for being so active in this uh, we're trying many of the art department we're trying to be active here as well thank you for that I mean thank you Agiris for both your reflections on Aeschylus which I think are deep and probably right and for sort of the reminder that those of us who are in borders and have citizenship um, have privilege and we often ignore our own complicity, right? And it's a hard thing to look at. I mean, in the US especially, those of us who live far away from our borders can ignore what happens, um, right? Because we don't have the sea close to us. Um, so in close, uh, yes, Damien, please. Sorry, I, I was just going, going to say just you know, on, on that topic of female um, refugees, that what I, one of the biggest things that I got from this play is, I, I mean, I, I, I'm an immigrant myself. I was born in Jamaica and I've always thought the immigration process was something that's very complex, right? The, to be a refugee is also something that's very com com complex. There's not a, a, a really cut and dry way to talk about it. But I've never looked at it from the sense of women and men, right? I, I've always looked, looked at it as one thing. And when you look at it as one thing, it can seem very dismissive and like, oh yeah, I mean, it's so com complex, I'll just choose to not pay attention to it, right? But when you look at it from an, an aspect of men and women, you see that in the countries that we're in, right? America, England, Greece, like where women have rights that we take for granted, that we don't realize that there's a lot of the world that, do, that do, do, doesn't give women those sort of freedoms, right? And when you look at it from that as, aspect, they should be the most important refugee that you are looking out for because in much of the world their rights are not theirs and so to, to put to lump it in and just oh this is a refugee thing and look at it all from one as aspect kind of diminishes the individuals that need the help the most right. and this play for me illuminated that because as i mean not, not to say that men have it easier but in some ways they they do um a woman running away from a, a country, if she can't leave, a lot of times her result is death or severe op oppression. And there is no way out. So yeah, I mean, this play just really just illuminated that in, in a way that I've never seen it. And I'd like to thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, Damien. Thank you. Um, so a few things before before we go. Um, Emma, who made some of the selections and helped with the um, help with the play, uh, had a couple of questions and wanted to speak about it. Emma, are you still there? Hi. Yes. Um, I I wanted to point out first of all, I wanted to thank everyone that has spoken today, uh, especially Roshni. Uh, thank you so 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 much for your contributions. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you to our actors and thank you, especially in this moment to Rebecca, who to give people a little bit of a peek behind the scenes. Um, there are some elements of this translation that are problematic and there are portions of this translation that uh, deliberately, deliberately erase the blackness of the Danaids and Rebecca was, Rebecca flagged that and Rebecca worked with, with the production team to undo that erasure because erasure is just as much of a form of linguistic violence as 
anything else. And I, yeah, I would love to throw to Rebecca too, um, if there's anything you wanted to address about the translation. I mean, um, yeah, I would just say this, this play is one of these things where when we use a, uh, a translation that is dated to the 19th century um, or the early 20th century, or really up until the 1960s or 70s, um, what you really see is an attempt to um, diminish um, the actual dynamics of the play in, in part because of a modern dynamic of anti-Blackness, which is designed to um, ensure that Egypt and North Africa remains a semi-white space um, that can be laid claim to by um, European heritage in ways that understanding and recognizing that the ancients saw the Egyptians as Black um, can't manage in a modern context. And so I think it's really important for us to be aware of that. Also, um, one of the things I edited from the play um, was the sort of willy-nilly use of the word race um, in the play for, for translations of things that weren't appropriate. And part of the reason I, I did that is because um, it perpetuates an idea when we sort of use the word race as a straight up translation for the Greek word genos, that there is a sort of primordial and historically long, long lasting and eternal idea of a separation of people by like primordial biology um, that is simply not true use of the word race. Um, so I, I try to be very cautious about what do the Greeks actually mean? What are they actually talking about? They're not talking about this modern construct that we have. They're talking about something else. Um, so this play causes problems because it's a play that bothers white scholars um, <laughs> a lot, but particularly white scholars who want to have ownership of ancient Greece um, and of the ancient Mediterranean as, as a specific white Western heritage. Um, and so uh, it's one of the things I sort of try to be very cautious of um, in any translations um, that I produce or in any discussions of the plays that I produce. So, Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Emma, um, for, for bringing it up to us again. So one of the things that has been amazing in this performance is listening to each other, react to the play, the expertise of the actors, our, our friends and associates coming in. Um, and what we're trying to do is sort of build our community around this and make this opportunity available for students at the high school and college level as well. Um, so Amy Pistone is here to talk about our ongoing competition um, and some of our plans for it. Yeah, thank you. Um, at first, I was a little anxious about following all of this really heavy talk about uh, refugees and about this really powerful play. But um, one of the things it actually does sort of connect nicely because Medea is in a lot of ways uh, also a play about about a woman who is a foreigner and and has to navigate identity and, and belonging as well. And so um, with that smooth segue, uh, we have an ongoing Medea competition where uh, our website is up and running now. And I think we can probably put that in the chat and we'll be sending it out on all kinds of listservs. Um, but for high school and for college students in the US and Canada, and there'll be a separate competition using a separate translation and things that'll be coming up soon in the UK. Um, and we really encourage whether you're able to be doing classes in person or if classes are remote, uh, getting students involved in thinking about this play. Emma and others have put together an amazing set of resources to contextualize the play Medea. We have selections from the chorus. We have um, one of Medea's amazing monologues where she's debating whether she can go through with killing her children. And um, there's just a lot of really great stuff available now. And I would encourage people to take a look at it and share it with their students. And if you have any questions, uh, Joel and Paul and myself um, are, are fairly easy to, to get a hold of on the internet. We're, we're fairly, fairly visible. Um, if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer that. But, um, oh, also there, is, there are cash prizes. So that is another exciting, uh, <laughs> exciting aspect to that. We've had some grant money that allows us to give out prizes for the best translation or the best performances of Medea. Thank you, Amy. Um, and thank you everyone for making this possible and the entire day possible. Um, again, I'm, I'm always honored to be a part of these things with these wonderful people. In addition to the actors, um, our work is made possible by our director, Paul O'Mahony, who's said he doesn't want to talk today, or Liz Fisher, associate director, Emma Pauly is dramaturg, um, and then producers, our executive producer, uh, Lana Coley, uh, Keith, Helen, Janet, Sarah, everybody who keeps the engines running. The beautiful posters are by John Coley and um, Ali Marbury. Um, so I thank you all. We'll be here next week at the same time, 3 p.m. in the U.S. Um, for Euripides Electra. Until then, everybody stay safe, stay strong, stay well. I hope to see you then. <laughs>